Infantile spasms is a really uncommon seizure disorder in very young children. It usually starts in the first year of life and is, is very subtle often in its appearance, sometimes with just a little forward flexion that sometimes looks like just a little startle or something like that. Infantile spasms typically presents just with little tiny flexion of the body and head, so something like this. Kids will pull forward just, just for a, less than a second often, maybe a second or two, and then relax. And then they will not have anything, and a few seconds later they'll do it again. It's not rhythmic like most seizures are. It's just kind of a periodic little flexion. Sometimes they extend, but the most common is flexion. Some of the most subtle ones are just little tiny head drops like this, and that's all you see is a little head drop. The child's laying down, you may not even see that. So it's just when they're sitting up, you may see their head come forward a little bit. One would think by looking at those little subtle spasms that this is just not something really important. It's not nearly as frightening as seeing somebody have a grand mal seizure. Um, but what's happening in the brain is an entirely different issue because that brain um, is telling you that the, the function of the brain is really disturbed. And that child cannot really be aware normally of all the things going on around them, so the opportunity for learning is kind of getting away from them. They just can't learn anything as long as that brain is having the disorganized pattern that we see with the, uh, with the infantile spasms. You know, infantile spasms may not be the best name for this kind of seizure disorder. It's also called West Syndrome, and it has a lot of other names too. But, you know, I, I think you're, you're correct that sometimes you think of a spasm and maybe a little muscle spasm where things stiffen up. And I suppose it looks a little bit like that, but it carries a much greater impact than just having a little muscle spasm. This is a really serious kind of epilepsy. It's really important to diagnose infantile spasms early and begin treatment as soon as possible to give the child the best chance for the best development. If, if a parent thinks that their child has infantile spasms, they should talk to their primary care doctor, their pediatrician or whoever, and discuss it with them and tell them they, they really need to have a referral to a child neurologist or neurologist for sure as soon as possible. In my view, the diagnosis is an urgent demand. Maybe not an emergency, not like somebody who's just been in a car accident and has to go to the emergency room, but it's something that needs to be taken care of in a very short number of days. That child needs to get to a child neurologist because they're the ones who are most capable of taking care of this child. And the first thing that's done is an electroencephalogram, a brainwave test. And there are very characteristic patterns on that uh, EEG that will tell us that this really does look like it's infantile spasms. Sometimes um, it's more subtle even on the EEG and we have to do a prolonged taping and monitoring and we admit patients to the hospital so that we can see what happens when they actually have the little spasm because again there are characteristic changes that we can see. So EEG is the first test that's done almost always in these patients. Once we know that it is infantile spasms then we need to understand why this child has the infantile spasms and there are literally hundreds of disorders that are associated with it. Some of them are the kinds of disorders that um, are not problematic for the brain by themselves, so if we can treat the child and get them to stop having the spasms, they can do quite well. Some of the disorders are problems with the brain that even if we stop the spasms, the child's still going to have development problems. 
but we need to figure out which one it is because many times that will guide the, the therapy that we would want to give for this child. One of the really common patterns we see with infantile spasms on the EEG is called hypsarrhythmia, which is really a kind of very disorganized, very high voltage abnormal, abnormality on the EEG. Not everybody who has infantile spasms has exactly hypsarrhythmia. There are things that are a little bit less than true hypsarrhythmia, but they still have infantile spasms. But almost any child who has hypsarrhythmia does have infantile spasms. If I've treated a child with infantile spasms and the parents come back two weeks later and they haven't seen anything that looks like a spasm, then I'm going to say, well, now we need to do an EEG to confirm that we have really resolved this problem. We haven't really resolved it until we see that the hypsarrhythmic pattern is no longer present on the EEG. So our, our practice is that we always check the EEG to be sure that we have really resolved the EEG abnormality. Insurance will, will always cover an EEG test in a child like this. And almost always, once we know, the second test we're going to do is an MRI scan to see if there's something structurally uh, different about this brain that will help us understand the cause. Most of the time, at the end of that, we will know whether the child has a cause that we'll identify. There are many other blood tests and urine tests that we do to uh, uncover the more uncommon disorders. The causes of infantile spasms is really interesting, and there are so many variations on this that you can't say that, that this disorder is clearly something that could be passed to another child or something like that, or are they at risk to have another child with this? The vast majority of them are not. They are, you know, when I'm talking to a parent, I just tell them, you know, the reason your child had infantile spasms and my child didn't is because you had bad luck and I didn't. There's nothing else to it. You did not do anything wrong. It's not something that could have been prevented by something you could have done. There are a few genetic disorders like tuberous sclerosis that can be passed on most of the time, neither of the parents has it, and it's just one of the things that happens in the child. Once in a while, one of the parents does have it. Well, we evaluate them so that they would know that. And there are other really rare disorders that may be genetic, and it's important to identify those so that they would know that um, if they had another child, there would be a risk of having this happen again. But most of them are not. Most of them are just what I call bad luck. When we talk about infantile spasms, we're, we're sometimes talking about the underlying cause. So if a child has a little structural abnormality in the brain that caused seizures and maybe caused focal seizures on one side uh, and then went into infantile spasms, treating the infantile spasms won't get rid of the focal seizure. We have to treat that as a separate thing. So yeah, there can be more than one thing. And then we've also talked about other underlying causes like tuberous sclerosis. So there are often other things associated with infantile spasms that we have to be aware of and take into account as we're, uh, we're treating the child. Whenever we have a child come in to us, uh, we admit them to the hospital to do the evaluation that we think needs to be done. Um, and one of the things we have to do is educate the parents about um, our concerns for the long-term developmental outcome for this child. About a third, maybe, of the children have what's called cryptogenic infantile spasms. That means that after we've done all of the things that we can do to try to see why this is happening, there isn't anything that we can find. The brain looks normal child maybe was developing okay before. If we treat that child really early, within the first three or four weeks of this disorder beginning, 
then many of those children will go on to be really normal children who will go to regular school and be okay. If we get to them later, then we start worrying that it will begin to have a long-term impact on what kind of development they're going to have. The best treatment for infantile spasms, first of all, is to start the treatment early. That's really important. Then the next important thing is, what is the most appropriate medication for this child? And there are probably three medications that one would think about. Two of them are steroid therapies. That is, one of them is an oral drug that you take a pill. The second one is an injection called ACTH. And the third therapy is another medication called Vigabatrin. Those are the three that we know are most likely to be successful. And of those three, probably two of them have the best evidence. That is, the ACTH that's given by injection and the Vigabatrin. The oral steroid is still kind of something that the doctors are discussing about whether it's as good or not as good as the other therapies, and maybe someday we'll know, but we don't really know now. Most of us who treat these patients frequently will pick one of the two Vigabatrin or ACTH drugs. If the child is in that cryptogenic category, that is the group of children that we just did not find a cause and this child looks to be otherwise a good possibility of developing normally, most I think would pick the ACTH therapy because it might give them a better chance for the most normal development. On the other hand, if the child has one of the disorders that's associated with it called tuberous sclerosis, that child's probably going to do best on the Vigabatrin. When we approach these therapies, one of the issues that comes into play is the cost. And some of the therapies are pretty expensive. In fact, the two drugs that are most likely to be successful, the ACTH and the Vigabatrin, are both pretty expensive drugs. Um, but there is a way that, let's say that a patient doesn't have insurance at all, and they just simply could not afford the, the medication. Well, there are ways that they can get that medication through a system called NORD that will provide assistance for that, that person so that they get the drugs. It's so important that there are ways to get the drug. Now, let's say on the other hand that a person does have insurance, but maybe their insurance company says, well, your copay for this is 20%, and maybe that copay is, you know, $5,000, and you just don't have $5,000. Again, that system will come into play that will help cover your expenses so that every child should be able to get one of these two medications regardless of what the drug costs. There are ways to make sure that that happens. Infantile spasms, you must get completely rid of the spasm. You cannot see any more of those little jerks. And the EG cannot have that hypsarrhythmia pattern anymore. You have to have both of those gone to give the child the chance for the best development. So in that sense, it's 100% resolution of the seizures and 100% resolution of the hypsarrhythmic EEG. I think it's important for parents to understand what the side effects are of the primary medications that we use. We don't have a medication that works for infantile spasms and stops these terrible seizures that doesn't have really significant side effect implications. Um, the ACTH has to be given by injection. Parents have to learn to do that because it's once or twice a day. And, they have, and parents have to do it at home. You're not gonna go to the doctor twice a day to get it done. Those children will all get very irritable and they'll eat like crazy and gain weight and, you know, it does have really significant side effects. The Vigabatrin has a side effect that, that some people will lose some of their vision out in the periphery where, you know, way out to the side. Doesn't happen to everybody, 
And as best we know, it takes a long time to happen. Um, so we think we can treat our young children for the period of time they might have infantile spasms and not get that, but we don't really know that yet. So that's still a worry. But even in spite of that, you say, you know, boy, that's really scary to have injections of, of medications and the side effects, or I'm really worried about division loss in my child. I'd rather not have those problems. Well, I'd rather not have those problems too, but I'd whole lot rather not have infantile spasms. That is a thousand times worse than any of the side effects we've talked about. If they're monitored and managed properly, you can really reduce the chance of anything really serious happening. But there are no risk-free medications for this. I think there are, there are parents who just can't face the prospect of giving their child an injection. That does happen. And then we, you know, if that is just something that is a rigid wall that they just cannot breach that wall and, um, and can't get past it, then okay, let's look at the other two good options that we have. We can give the oral steroid, which probably is not as effective, or we can give the Vigabitrin, and then we discuss the side effects of those issues. The steroid side effect is probably the same as the side effect is giving the ACTH, except you're not giving it by injection. And the Vigabitrin we've talked about with the peripheral field defects. So, you know, uh, I, I would never really tell somebody this is what you have to do because we do have a couple of other options that are good options, but maybe not quite as good as long as they understand that maybe we're, we're not giving the drug that has the best chance of helping, then that's a decision the parents have to make. I'm not going to try to talk them into something that they aren't willing to accept. One of the reasons it's called infantile is because the majority of patients have spasms only in the first year or two of life, and then the spasms go away. So if you wait long enough, all spasms will go away, or most of them will go away. Those children, however, have lost the opportunity for development during a very critical time in their life, and they will go on to another kind of seizure disorder that is almost as problematic as infantile spasms. So I would never um, agree with a parent that treatment is not something that should be done. If a child has cryptogenic, that is, we do not find a cause, as best we can tell, there's nothing other than infantile spasm going wrong with this child's brain and we get to the child within the first three or four weeks maximum, and we give them an effective therapy that works, then that child has a very good chance of going on to be entirely normal. I've had children who've had infantile spasms go to college, so some of them will do spectacularly well, and they will just go back to whatever was going to be their life as though this had never happened. It's a little bump in the road for them. So those factors become very important, recognizing it, getting it diagnosed, treating it early, but also having the cryptogenic variety. One of the therapies that's kind of come into, into play in the last several years has been the ketogenic diet. And there's clearly some evidence that it might be helpful. But if ACTH or Vigabertrin or, or prednisone don't work, that's actually a pretty reasonable thing to try next. Um, might be more effective than some of our other medications. Uh, and it is something you can do. I mean, it's a difficult diet to keep um, track of because you have to weigh everything and it's a very high fat diet and maybe some people would say, well, that doesn't look very healthy, but these children actually do quite well on it. And I don't think the, the quote, unhealthy part of it is an issue that we have to worry about. Again, the infantile spasms are much more important. So I think the diet is a reasonable uh, treatment and we do use it in our patients. The primary issues that concern families are, will this affect my child's development? Because sometimes they're seeing that they're losing their developmental milestones right now. So what's going to happen 
to my child developmentally. So that is a key issue. And then the most important issue to them is, can we treat this and what's the best way to treat it? Any child with an illness that is kind of threatening, whether it's this kind of epilepsy or diabetes or a tumor or something like that, is a great stress on the family. And the divorce rate goes up. And I tell the parents that this is going to be a stress. And I, they're usually there together at the beginning. And I tell them, this is really good that you're here together. It's important that you work together on this thing. And this is something that you deal with as a family. But I also tell them, if you feel like you're starting to drift apart and you're not working together on this, go see a family therapist or a psychiatrist or somebody to try to help you get through this. Uh, it doesn't have to break up your family, but if you let it, it has a good chance that it will. One of the things that's really been difficult with infantile spasms is we, we don't really have a clear understanding of exactly why this happens. We know it's part of development because it only happens at a certain stage of the brain's development, so it clearly has something to do with development. We don't know exactly what that is. But there's some really great research going on now that we're beginning to understand that development and have ways of understanding what's happening to a brain when it's having infantile spasms. And I think over time, that's going to lead to new therapies that, that I hope will be a whole lot more successful than the ones we have now, and maybe with fewer side effects than the ones we have now. So I think there's real hope for the future with the technologies that we now have. It's really different than it was when I started 40 years ago. I think, first of all, they need to get to their child neurologist and, and get the education that a child neurologist can give them about their specific child with whatever's going on with that. The second thing is then there, there's the Epilepsy Foundation of America that is for people and families who have epilepsy issues. It's not the professional society, it's for the people who deal with it. And you will find other, other families maybe that have similar problems that you can talk to and help understand how they got through some of the issues that they had to deal with. One of the most exciting times for me is when we have a child whose future appeared to be greatly threatened and, and we've been able to do all the right things for that kid and that child now seems to be doing really well. I mean, that's a great day for me. I'm, you know, it's, um, child neurology in a lot of ways is a difficult profession to be in because so many children have so many problems and that's really hard. But when you get the opportunity to really save the future of a child, it's about the most exciting thing that can happen. You know, it's, it kind of makes all the tough ones worth it to get a chance to really do something really important for a kid. One of the really exciting things is to see a child who had infantile spasms that did well when they're in their teen years or starting college. And you have a chance to see them or meet them. They come back, you know, just to say hello because they, you know, their parents bring them back. They don't remember anything, but their parents do. And, you know, it's a time it, that, that is just a terrific feeling. And it's usually a time of a lot of hugs and that's really great and you know that kind of thing. It's, it's a very exciting time to see that. It does happen. I have seen that.